Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival based in South Carolina, USA. I would like to welcome you from wherever in the world that you may be watching. If the past fraught 18 months has taught us anything, it has taught us that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It's no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. Please come and see for yourselves, but make sure to visit during the Charleston Literary Festival, which takes place during the first half of November each year. Meanwhile, I hope that you enjoy the 2021 Charleston Literary Festival and that it makes you think and dream afresh. Good afternoon. My name is Camila Martin and I am Professor of African American Studies and English and I currently serve as the Dean of the Graduate School at the College of Charleston. I am delighted to be here with all of you for the culminating event of the Charleston Literary Festival and to discuss a topic so intimately tied to Charleston. It is also my pleasure to introduce our guest, author of All That She Carried, Taya Miles. Taya Miles is professor of history and Radcliffe alumni professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and director of the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. She is a recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and the Height Prize in the Humanities from the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. Professor Miles is the author of The Dawn of Detroit, which won the Frederick Douglass Book Prize, among other honors, as well as the acclaimed books, Ties That Bind, The House on Diamond Hill, The Cherokee Rose, A Novel of Gardens and Ghosts, and Tales from the Haunted South, a published lecture series. Professor Miles is going to get us started with some opening remarks about all that she carried. Professor Miles. Thank you so much, Dean Martin, for that warm introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, I wish I could be with you in person. I have spent uh, many a day and even weeks in Charleston, such a beautiful city, such a rich cultural heritage, a part of which I would like to share with you this afternoon. So I thought what I would do is to just offer some framing and orienting uh, discussion about my new book, All That She Carried, and about its origins and sort of where it got started for me and how it developed before turning the mic back over to you, Dean Martin. This project started for me with an object, a seemingly simple object, which is now known as Ashley's sack. And hope if you could please put up the image. Thank you. 
This is the back of the sack that I'm referring to, Ashley's sack. And uh, this bag was a seed sack, an agricultural tote, uh, a utilitarian item that was manufactured in the mid 19th century. This image that we see of it, the back of it in particular, uh, makes it seem as if it would be unworthy of notice. But there's actually much more to the history and the story of this sack than we can see on the surface. And the more of this history is what became the genesis of my book, All That She Carried. I'm going to read to you now the very first description of the sack, which was crafted by curators at the Middleton Place Plantation, who had received the sack as a donation from a flea market shopper in Tennessee who happened to find it in a bin of rags. So the trajectory of this sack, its history is quite surprising. It has many twists and turns. This is what the curators at Middleton Place wrote about this sack after they received it and began to do research. Quote, Charleston, South Carolina, circa 1850 sack, 1921 needlework. Plain weave cotton ground, cotton lock stitch fabrication, three strand cotton embroidery floss, back stitch embroidery. Height 29, 11 by 16, width 15 and three quarter inches. Sacks made of plain weave cotton, like this example, were manufactured for flower seeds and other food staples beginning in the late 1840s with the invention of the industrial sewing machine. Unlike stitching by hand, the double locking chain stitch produced by the machine made a seam strong enough to hold heavy contents. The numerous worn spots had been reinforced with rectangles of cloth carefully hand sewn into place. In this image, we can see some of those repairs that have been made onto the sack. And I am very grateful to Mary Edna Sullivan of Middleton Place for sharing this early material with me, which exists in the foundation's archives there. Now, until late this year, this sack was on display in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. It had been on loan from the Middleton Place Foundation, which is the owner of the sack, again, having received it by way of the contribution of a shopper. And uh, Middleton Place uh, apparently plans to loan the sack for exhibition in the new International African American Museum in Charleston. And uh, I know I will be excited to see it there in person. So this sack has taken many twists and turns, but I think even more compelling than the story of its movement from institution to institution, and even uh, more compelling than the discovery of it in a flea market, is what this sack can tell us about African-American women's lives during the period of slavery. What it can tell us about women and textile work and clothing and creativity, what it tells us about Black families and the things they held dear, their keepsakes, their heirlooms, their inheritances, and also what it can tell us about uh, larger shared themes across all subsets of humanity having to do with how it is that people bear up to pain and trauma and emergency and how it is that people can find resilience in their lives. The main idea that I think we take from this sack and its story and the women who patched it in those little triangles and squares that we see on the back of the sack is that love was their answer to the terrible problems and barriers that they faced. And love was their means of achieving resilience. So it turns out that the research indicates that this sack was handed down among a family of black women and especially between mothers and daughters. Now we know even in our day, mothers and daughters and you know, aunties and cousins, great aunts and grandmothers 
pass down keepsakes, as do many other family members and many other close friends. They do this as a way to remember departed loved ones, as a way to hold those loved ones close to them. But these women were passing down a keepsake in a set of circumstances that we can scarcely imagine today. We try, you know, we do our best to try to research, on earth and understand the facts of human enslavement in this country, but we can never fully approach it because we no longer live in a society in which certain groups of the population are deemed chattel, are deemed property, are deemed things in which the system is actually entrenched in the law and entrenched in culture. It is uh, the everyday mode of life that people move in. We can't understand that. But this was the case for an African-American enslaved woman named Rose and her daughter, Ashley, the two women who are at the center of the story of the sack. And we know from research on the sack that Rose used it as a way to try to protect and to provide for little Ashley. Rose packed into the sack a dress, a braid, pecans, and a mother's love. Now, as the curators at Middleton Place discovered right away, the sack no longer contains these items. And we can imagine that, that Ashley probably used them uh, over the course of her time with the sack, or that perhaps some of the Items may have even been lost over time. But love, love must surely still remain in that sack. And I think that we can feel it when we see the sack, you know, either via images like here this afternoon or uh, in person, which you and Charleston um, are having the chance to do again. In the book, All That She Carried, I try to reconstruct the story of these women who packed and bestowed and passed down the sack. And I also try to think about the various items that were packed and what they meant and how they might have been used. So for example, I write about the dress that was packed into the sack. And I think in the book about how Ashley may have been able to use this dress as a protection for her body against the elements and as actually a protection against people who may have had ill intent for her as a screen in front of her body. And I talk about how she may have been able to use this dress as an element of escape because historians such as Laura Edwards have written about the ways in which enslaved people could use a different set of clothing to disguise themselves and to come across to appear as an entirely different person. And they often did this by uh, dressing in the, the gendered items of the other sex. So women often dress like men. The braid that Rose packed, I write about in the book, could have functioned as a memento, as a memory device, even um, like a photograph in a way that could have reminded Ashley of her mother. And of course it was a tactile part of her mother's body, which has um, intense meaningful ramifications for their continuing connectedness across distance. And the pecans were an incredibly nutritious kind of food. They were also uh, a luxury food in Charleston back in the 1850s. So it's possible that they could have been intended for trade by Rose, such that Ashley could have used them to acquire other goods. And love, we can't quite see, we can't quite touch, we can't quite represent, but it would have been the biggest and the most important and the most eternal thing that Rose packed that day in preparation for her daughter's sale. 
Because this is the reason why Rose packed that sack. This is the reason why she got a hold of the dress and the nuts and why she clipped off a braid of her own hair and why she packed that sack with love. Because she knew that her daughter Ashley was going to be separated from her through forcible sale in Charleston's slave market. And so Rose gave her this sack on the eve of their separation. And generations later, a descendant of Rose and Ashley named Ruth told the story of her foremother's party. And she actually sewed that story onto the sack itself. Can we have a second image, please? Thank you. So I know the wording might not be perfectly clear to you. So I'm going to read what it is that has been sewn onto the front of the sack. My great-grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. The embroidered story of forced separation and loss on the sack is so common in the history of African-American slavery. And yet, it becomes breathtakingly particular to this mother, Rose, and to this daughter, Ashley, in the story that we are given on the sack. And the particularity of the story not only makes it more real to us, I think, but it also helps us to really focus in on that experience of enslaved Black women and girls. And I think that through focusing in we see not only that Black women did survive the atrocities of enslavement, but also how they survived these traumas. And in the book, I try to think through both of these questions. The fact of survival, despite atrocity, and the method, the means, the techniques of survival. I end up concluding that in this inscription on the sack, we see something like a prescription for how it is that Black women and Black families were able to pass through this nightmarish time in our history. And they seem to have done so by recognizing what it was that their loved ones and their dependents would need to be able to take those next steps into the future and then doing the best that they could to provide for those needs, even in the face of scarcity. So we see from this embroidered inscription and we see from what basically is a list that Ruth Middleton has preserved, that Rose made sure to provide her daughter Ashley with food, with clothing, and even with a form of shelter. And here, I thank the Middleton place uh, curators, excuse me, so very much for taking the time to measure the dimensions of that sack, because through that specific detail, we can see that this was actually quite a long object. And it was just wide enough that a small nine-year-old girl could perhaps use it as a covering, as a blanket, as um, something like um, the top of a tent over her head in inclement weather. And maybe she could even crawl inside it and use it like a sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. This sack could have provided her a shelter in the physical world, as well as certainly providing her with the shelter of the emotional caretaking of her mother's love. And so we can see through some thought and some pulling on the threads of this sack that it was not an ordinary object at all 
that the first appearance of a plain old bag is deceptive. And uh, I do think that this seeming simplicity, this seeming idea that there's not really much there, can be compared to the ways in which Black women's history has been viewed oftentimes in the past as something in which, oh, it's straightforward. Oh, we don't need to devote much time to that. Oh, there's not really much there and that the sources do not exist. Instead, Ashley Sack shows us that Black women's history is real, it is rich, and we can access it if only we listen to Black women's stories. So I will end there and thank you uh, for, for attending to that preamble. I'll hand it back over to Dean Martin, to Camila. Thank you, Taya. What, what an incredible story this is. Um, I listened to the text um, in, on audiobook, and I will admit I was holding my breath through the entire experience, and I wept at the end. And I find myself listening to you, particularly as you read the inscription on the sack that I've read and I've, I've listened to and I've engaged with for some time, but just hearing you read that has such a visceral response for me even in this moment. And, and so I just, I wanna start just by thanking you um, as a scholar for recovering this story because it is such a powerful example of the resiliency of enslaved people. Um, so we're gonna try to get through this conversation, but I am just all, I am just in it. And I'm just so grateful to even be able to talk about this story because it's such, it's such an incredible story that we even have um, this artifact to look back on. Um, so let's let's jump in here. Um, let's begin with the title. Um, you approach this artifact, as you mentioned, as a testament to Black enslaved women's lives and their expressions of hope and love. Um, so who is the literal or figurative she in the title, all that she carried? And what is it that she has or is carrying? Oh, Camila, uh, I, I'm already so into this conversation. I, I greatly appreciate um, your comments to open us up. And uh, I just love the direction of that question. There's so much that I have to say already to you that I hope you will forgive me for just kind of jumping back one moment in what it is you said, and then I'll come to the question. Sure. About the you said that you enjoyed the audiobook. I'm so glad you enjoyed the audiobook. Uh, I, I think the narrator is, is wonderful. And I was so happy to have had the chance to uh, select the narrator for the book. And I also think that what you just pointed out has to do with oral culture and orality and the, the importance of that in African-American experience in the past and in the present, and also you know, in, in broader American experience and American culture. I don't think we realize how much of our culture is oral. And we, know we, we love books, right? We love papers, but uh, we have conversations all throughout our, our days that are only spoken. And I think that that connects us back to um, a deep human history before we had writing. And this story that, that we get in the sack most certainly was an oral story. I think that's why you feel it when you hear it. That's yeah. why I feel it when I read it and when I hear it every yeah. single time, because we know, or we, we intuit that this story was told to her. She heard that story. Mm -hmm. And we know it was told to her because we see the signs of morality in the text itself. We can even hear Black English, can't we? Yes, we can yes, yes. yes. I mean, that was my favorite line. That was my yes. favorite line. Yes. We feel the love always. Filled. That's right. <laughs> and we see that we see that phrase told her in the middle of the sack. So in that moment, Ruth Middleton is recovering and she's preserving for history, and she's reporting to the readers of the sack 
that this was an as told to moment. So I love it that you brought that out, the oral aspect of, of the sack. And actually I realized that by speaking, you know, at the concluding moment of this festival, we are continuing that tradition. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Yes. yes. Um, so to your question of the title, who is the she? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know how many people are realizing that that she was meant to be multiple and open. I am so happy that you pointed that out uh, because this book is about so many women at once. Mm-hmm. So many women who are carrying the weight of history, mm-hmm. the future of their children, mm-hmm. the future of their people. So it is about Rose, it's about Ashley, and they are sack carriers, but it's also about their descendants and all the other Black women whose firsthand accounts, especially by way of autobiographies, slave narratives, and letters, I bring into the book as a way of offering some context and some anchoring Mm -hmm. telling the story of Mm -hmm. Rose Ashley and Ruth's lives. So she is certainly the woman named on the sack. Sure. And she is also every other woman whose voice I bring in. And she's also the sack itself. She Mm. is the sack Mm -hmm. itself Mm -hmm. because the sack is also doing the work of carrying. The sack is also a character in a sense in this story. And one of the things that I try to think about in the book is the meaning of things and the way in which certain kinds of special things, especially sacred things, seem to have their own life and animacy. And so um, I was hoping that uh, some readers would take it exactly where you took it. So this is so great yeah, yeah. To, to feel yeah, absolutely roominess in that she. Yes, absolutely. That's, you know, there were not just multiple names, but I am, I am a literary scholar by training. So, you know, pulling from these other narratives, like it was just, it was just so multidisciplinary, multivocal. It was, it was just all of the things. And, and so there's no way that I came away with this understanding um, that there was not just a, a singular she. And so I thought that was important to kind of bring out um, in this opportunity to, to actually speak to the author. Um, so moving right along, you know, I I stumbled a little bit. Um, the prologue and then the introduction. I found myself having to just whew, hit pause and and breathe a little bit just through those first two introductory pieces. Um, emergency packs. I want to talk about this idea of emergency pack. Right? You frame Ashley Sack as a type of emergency pack from Rose to her daughter upon their pending separation. Um, And I thought a lot about um, what it was like for you to do this work. I was thinking about what it was like for me to listen to this this work, you know, also as a scholar who is very familiar with some of these histories, right? So this is not new material, but it was still very difficult to get through in some spaces. And so I was thinking about you, you quote Sadia Hartman, um, her, her text, Lose Your Mother. And if anyone has read that, then they know that that book, like she pulls no punchy. She's telling you, she's expressing exactly how difficult it can be to engage with the archive when studying the histories of, of slavery. And so my question to you is, as you dove into this project, what was in your emergency pack? to help you navigate the heaviness of these stories? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're taking us right to the heart of it, aren't you? You gotta go there, because we got to. (laughs) Well, um, I'm gonna work my way toward the center of your question and say that um, it took me a little while to Think about Ashley Sack in the language of an emergency, you know, pack or an emergency kit. And um, I really seized on that by doing exactly the thing that you mentioned, and that is working across disciplines. So it was rereading Octavia Butler, 
and rereading her novel, Parable of the Sower, mm. and, and you know, thinking about that main character's own use of an emergency pack to get out of some seriously dire straits, that led me to see what Rose was doing in a similar way. Mm-hmm. And so um, one of the things in my own pack was, I think, an openness to the literary, you know, your field, you know, an openness to thinking about various ways of asking questions, various ways of finding insights when it came to doing this project. And so this project, as you have said, it's not strictly historical. It is um, very much an interdisciplinary kind of book, which draws on lots of fields, some of which are close to my heart and close to my training, and some of which, you know, they're a little bit further away. Yeah. So I, I tried. I did some reading and you know psychological studies, you know, <laughs> for right. this to try to understand the sense of how does narrative work in the mind, how does narrative work with trauma, and there I was stretching a bit far afield. But I think that that did help to bulk up my sack for trying to understand the meaning and history of of this object. And I also, I feel very fortunate to to be a part of not just a single generation, but multi-generations of Black women scholars who have been uncovering certain texts and uncovering certain aspects of Black women's history for quite a while, and who have been pointing out and trying to actually work their way, you know, our way into the problem of the archives. So I was not alone in asking these questions by any means. I was not alone in even dealing with the emotional response, sometimes the feeling of heartache that comes with doing the work. And it makes a big difference to not be isolated. I mean, that's what Rose was doing, I think, in many ways, um, when she packed the sack, but also when she included a braid of her own hair. Yes. I mean, she was... I mean, that braid is, is like, I mean, it's a thread, it's even a, it's a rope, it's a handhold for Ashley going forward so that Ashley is not alone. And um, I never felt alone working on this. And um, in addition to that feeling of both intellectual and emotional support that I felt like I always had from you know, fellow women scholars, I had the great fortune of not being the first person to research this act. So there are a number of scholars who have taken a different angle to look at this sack. One of them's name is Mark Auslander. He's an anthropologist. Another one's name is Heather Williams. She's a historian. There have been many journalists who have written about this Mm -hmm. sack. I first learned about it from a journalist in Savannah named Ben Goggins, who mentioned it to me when I was down there in Savannah. Um, Jeff Neal from Middleton Place, a curator at Middleton Place, had actually just been through Savannah uh, presenting about the sack, and Ben Goggins was there and wrote about it and told me about it. So mm-hmm. having input and having you know, information, shared information by a number of people, many of whom do not you know, share my identity or or my um, my positioning or my standpoint, uh, was definitely a part of my emergency sack for working on this project. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you kind of answered and anticipated my next question, which was going to be a little bit about methodology, but, but I'll, I'll move forward because I am interested, particularly in the way that, um, and, and, and for me, it, it really resonated um, because you did turn to um, even fiction, right, to kind of help ground the way that we received um, this story. Um, and and I, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about um, what you call your application of Black feminist historical methods um, and why that was so important to you, um, because you do mention that there were other scholars who have, have been looking at this, but you chose this particular angle. And so if, if you'd like to say more about that, I, I'd love to, to engage that. Uh, but I take that just a step further um, to ask um, what was the most challenging topic to explore? Um, because you do mention that there are areas that were just completely new to you, right? Um, so maybe you could share with us also one of those areas where you just kind of had to 
fumble your way through and figure out how to engage a particular topic. Like mm -hmm. the conference, for instance. That one <laughs> just like, wow, who knew you could actually research the history of a particular pecan tree, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So there was quite a lot of fumbling you know, through this project. This has been the hardest project that I have ever undertaken. Mm -hmm. And um, the difficulty stems for the most part from the limitation on the sources. The SAC is really the main source that we have about these women, about Rose and Ashley and Ruth. The other sources that we have um, can corroborate parts of what the SAC says, but not all of it. And there is not a single existing source that uh, basically allows us to say, okay, this date, that date, this name, that name, this place, that place. We really can't go back and forth um, among multiple sources as historians um, prefer to do and mm -hmm. often do to verify what the SAC is saying. That was the biggest difficulty. That was a tremendous challenge. Um, I have a colleague, you know, a wonderful historian of African-American women's history, very talented, very gifted, who said that she thought about doing a book on this for a while and then just decided, mm, no. I mean, there, there's, there's not a lot there to begin with. And I think that that situation, um, it, it might lead to a person turning to another project. And this, this colleague uh, turned to a different project, which is a wonderful prize winning book. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also might lead to a situation as it did for me of a person saying, okay, this is what it is. And I can't turn away from this story because it's so compelling to me, you know, personally. So it just, it, it just grabs me personally. And so what do I do? What does one do in the face of scarcity? Now, in this next comment, Camila, I am not attempting to make a one-to-one -one comparison between me and Rose or, you know, or you and Rose or any Black woman scholar today and our enslaved ancestors. Mm -hmm because a lot of time has gone by and a lot of change and condition has happened. But I can say that I have taken inspiration in this project from the fact that Rose faced scarcity too. And even though she didn't have everything at her disposal to try to save her daughter, even though she didn't even own her own self, she kept moving forward. And so for me with the stack facing what was the biggest challenge of the project, I felt, goodness gracious, you know, if, if, if Rose could have that kind of hope and think that quickly on her feet and pack that sack for Ashley, certainly I can find a way to talk about something for which the sources do not exist in the way that I would hope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I do want to come back to, to your question where you asked me to elaborate about um, Black feminist historical methods. Because there is, I mean, there are many ideas in the book that draw from this rich tradition, but one of the ideas that was very important is the argument, the notion that we must look at Black women historical actors, not just as the objects of our study, but as thinkers in their own right, as intellectuals mm -hmm. in their own mm -hmm. right. This was so important for me because it enabled me to see not only other enslaved women who later told their stories or wrote uh, slave narratives uh, as thinkers and as intellectuals, but also to see Rose as a thinker, mm -hmm. to sit back and, and um, consider what she put in that sack and to consider what might have been going through her mind. What must she have known? What must she have mm -hmm. questioned or thought about? Mm -hmm. What did she feel compelled by as she imagined the future when she packed that sack. And that lens just opened up so much in the project. Mm -hmm. And I began to see Rose as an intellectual, as a thinker, as the creator of this incredibly dynamic um, collection of materials. And also when I began to see Ruth Middleton as an oral historian, that was another big leap for me, Camila. Absolutely. Realizing, wait a minute, Ruth Middleton heard this. We know she heard it because we, we, you and I talked about orality. Right. And she wrote it down. I mean, yes, yeah, she used a needle. She used thread. That's another form of writing, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a very creative form of writing. So she listened. She recorded. That's exactly what an oral historian does. Right. So this was really important in the project for me. 
um, as was fiction, and you mentioned that, because even when we do have documents, when we have um, fact-based sources about Black women who were enslaved, Black men who were enslaved, families who were enslaved, Indigenous families who were enslaved, um, we don't get, get any kind of sense of their inner experience. Right. Those documents are typically very bare bones and ba very mm -hmm. skeletal and very cold and distant and very unfeeling. And this is a place where I think fiction can come in because the fiction writer has the intention and, and the freedom and kind of the, the breadth of movement and flexibility to try to imagine those inner lives. Now, they may, they may not, you know, get it exactly on, uh, they might not get it exactly on target and, you know, be 100% correct because they weren't there and it's impossible for us to know, but they can explore those emotional, psychological dimensions in a way that we just can't get from the historical documents alone. So fiction became very important for me in terms of trying to see if I could add greater dimensions of humanity to the telling of Rose's and Ashley's and Ruth's story. Absolutely, and, and I think you did such a phenomenal job at doing just that. Um, I felt so, so engaged in, in, in a lot of literary scholarship talks about just that thing, how fiction writers are able to um, take what they know about the culture and their lived experience and put it into this fiction, right? That reads more like real life than it does fiction. And I absolutely got that from like, I felt like, okay, yes, we know that these are probably the facts, but here's this whole other side to the story that gives humanity to these women that helps us to know these women in, in certain ways. And it's, it's so funny because, you know, when I read about the, the section about the braid, right? Um, and you were kind of talking about the sack as, as even being this sort of um, kind of conjuring sack, right? This, this thing of protection and, and it had this piece of hair in it. You know, my mother, I, maybe three years ago, she cut her hair um, and she decided that when she cut it, she, she, she plaited it up and she cut all the plaits and she gave one to her granddaughters uh, my nieces at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is, so it was like, I know what Rose was doing. Like mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. it very much. Like mm -hmm. had you not even mentioned it ever again in the book, I would have understood what was happening in that exchange of the hair, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I just want to say that you did such a phenomenal job at really bringing those things together, the, the facts, but also the narrative. And, you know, I tell my students, you know, when it comes to black folks, you know, fact and fiction is is really just, you know, uh, we, we can talk about John Henry. We can talk about some of these other folk heroes that we know existed. Right. But we know their story mostly because of these, these oral traditions. Right. And they may not all be true, but they're not all lies either. Right. And so we, there's that that intimacy that we get um, by this sort of improvisation of the fact and the fiction. And I just thought, wow, this this book really just just hit it on on the head and i'm i'm just so so thrilled and excited about teaching this teaching this book um in, in the future um so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to shift a little bit because i want to i want to talk about another observation i made in the way that you approach this text and you know i've been debating whether or not i'm going to go here but i'm going to go here because you okay know, we're, let's see where you're going to take us right because you talk about this notion right of narrating counter histories of slavery right um and this really calls to mind the current debates and misunderstandings of critical race theory as i read through your book i thought what a phenomenal example of how critical race theory can work Let's start there. What it what it can do in practice, right? Um, it recovers multiple narratives of slavery and its aftermath by focusing on the subjects that are usually excluded from these mainstream histories, right? And you even say you could not get to Rose and Ashley's stories without first relying on right the archives of the enslaver, right? And so we really see how 
those histories really have to be told together to get the full picture, right? And you're not necessarily villainizing, you know, the Martin family or their descendants, and it's you're not attacking them, but you're saying this is the reality, right? If we look at this picture, we know that there were those who were enslaved. And in order to understand fully their history, we have to deal with the enslaver, right? We have to put those two things together. And so I wanted to just ask your thoughts about um, your work and, and it being an example of critical race theory. And if you have any um, experience of, of how that might translate in the classroom, or if you've taught this story or this history in, in the classroom. Okay, Dean Martin. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh my goodness. What a lightning rod of an issue this is about critical race theory. My thoughts were going in all different directions as you were laying out that question. And um, I think I will, I will first say that as you and I know, and many people gathered here may also know, there's a difference between critical race theory as a set of um, publications and ideas that have been taught in graduate schools and you know quote CRT as it is being as it has been labeled and as it as as it is being discussed in the culture writ large right now these are not the same things and in addition to that the so-called CRT right now is kind of a grab bag, hodgepodge, mixed lot of all different kinds of things that, that I will say, it seems to me that, that some politically intentioned individuals are, are throwing together as a way to, I don't know, I mean, foment cultural division, but I mean, that's how it feels to me. That is how it feels to me, mm -hmm. that, it, that it has now become sort of a, a, a political tool to separate people. That's not how the field first emerged when I was reading about it in graduate school. And um, the so-called CRT today is not an accurate reflection of that scholarship. Uh, I do think that my work has been influenced by critical race theory. It had to have been. I read it in graduate school. Mm -hmm. What that kind of work helped me to think through, for example, the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, where the ways in which the structures that we have built in the society and that we live with today, uh, first of all, come out of a history, right? They come out of the kind of history that is that I try to make visible in all that she carried, the kind of history that people who live in Charleston know happened. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And they also, these structures, tend to render invisible particular kinds of people who live at the intersections of American life. Mm -hmm. For example, a, a black poor woman is not gonna be as visible or represented in many of our societal structures, even as these structures are actually a result of uh, many decades and centuries of past exploitation. I don't think there's any denying that. Now, I think that, that, we, that we can debate about how it is that we might want to continue to add complexity and nuance to those ideas. Mm -hmm. And we, we should consider at what age is this kind of material appropriate for teaching you know, to, to students? I uh, certainly um, did not see my children learning about these ideas in grade school. I don't really know where that whole discussion is coming from. I mean, at, at the grade school, at the grade school level, one needs, I think, to teach children the truth of the past gently and gradually. I know as a mother, I was pretty careful about when I introduced the history of slavery to my kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, didn't, I didn't want them to, at a very young age, feel that they were inferior to anybody or to feel that their history was all about um, being degraded and being abused. And so I started with, I started on kind of the, the Rosa Parks line of teaching my children. And then, you know, we worked our way around to slavery. So I think there are age appropriate times for some of these things. Um, 
as far as my book and how it, it might be read as or it might fit into a critical race theory conversation today, I'll say a few things. History is full of complexity and complication and surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to see that and accept that. And you know, here's here's one surprise that was very critical, very fundamental to my work. Mm -hmm. But as a Charleston, I had the great fortune of working with a librarian, Jesse Nelson. And uh, Jesse Nelson is a, a wonderful person who um, has had a long career in um, research, and he works with people on their books. He does genealogical research. He was willing to work with me on this book and, and did quite a lot of the unearthing work. Uh, trying to pin down Rose and Ashley. And Jesse Nelson is a white man. He's a white man who was absolutely 100% behind this project and wanted to mm -hmm. have these Black women's lives told in a sensitive and full and humanizing, as he's saying, way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jesse Nelson is also a person who has recognized through his own research that, well, how should I put it? Charleston families, South Carolina families, Southern families, American families, they go deep, right? And there were a lot of, let's say intimacies. Right. <laughs> in these families over time, we are not all who we necessarily think we are. The divisions that we mm -hmm. hold on to aren't necessarily secure and fast. I think that right. I had more common with, with Jesse Nelson than we may have at first thought seeing each other as a black woman and a white man because I have white ancestry mm -hmm. and I'll let Jesse Nelson tell his own family story, which he, which he tells, you know, with pride and, and you know, with, with mm -hmm. this. And so there's a lot more to, to these histories than um, necessarily meets the eye at first. And I think that we are doing a disservice to everyone when we try to take a huge brush and paint everything with it and when we try to close off ideas and information, mm -hmm. that can actually help people to see themselves in a different light, in a fuller light, and to want to make deeper connections with others. And uh, I feel like I got worked up on this one, but I want to tell you something uh, <laughs> in response to this question, which is I was um, I was in a Zoom conversation with um, some women who had came who had come together to talk about all that she carried organized by the Maryland libraries. Okay. And the person who organized it, I don't, I don't know her personally. She's a white woman. And she told me at the end that she felt that this book was better than any diversity training that a person could ever take. And so I, I don't know her politics. She certainly would have had to have been open to reading a book like this to have organized it. And you know, she works for the libraries. <laughs> I think that would mean she would have an open mind. But the question seemed to suggest that she may have had a little bit of a sense of tension or resistance to the idea of diversity training. Mm -hmm. And she came away from this book feeling that it was able to get at some of these issues, but to still create a sense of openness and possibility as opposed to shutting things down. And that's what I what I intended. That's what I hoped and that's what I want. I would not want anything that I produce, and certainly the stories of these remarkable women to lead to further division right. in this country. But I think the story is actually all about connection at its mm -hmm. heart and, and at its center. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. So it looks like we are winding down. We do have one question so far from the audience. Um, are there any genealogical records at Middleton Plantation about Ruth Middleton and her family? Thank you for that question. Um, so Middleton Place Foundation was very generous to me in allowing me to come in and to read through their archives. And they have incredible archives, incredible archives about the plantation. And I will say too, since Dean Martin's at the College of Charleston, the College of, the, the College of Charleston also has incredible archives. And I found some things at the college that were also Middleton Place. So there are some, some duplications of primary materials in these locations. If you want to do research, I recommend that you go to both places. Go to the Addlestone Library, College of Charleston, and request permission to, to look at the Middleton Place Foundation archival records. There is not 
any material in the Middleton Place Foundation records that suggests directly that Ruth Middleton has ancestry tying back to that plantation. And this is something that the curators there um, were looking for very carefully. They looked through the records carefully for this. I did as well. I looked through all of those old original lists of enslaved people. I'm talking about handwritten lists of enslaved people that the Middletons owned. And there were a number of women who were named Rose there, but there wasn't a Rose who seemed to have been there at the right time that would match up to the Rose on the sack. And there also wasn't an Ashley you know, who, who appeared in those records. It is possible that Ruth Middleton may have had uh, an in-law connection to Middleton Place, which is something that the anthropologist Mark Auslander suggests in an article that he has published online. But as far as direct lineage, uh, there's not an indication. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it looks like we have uh, used up all of our time, um, and and I can I I have several other questions that I could I could ask, but um, I want to simply uh, again thank you just for your contribution to. Um, will say public history, I loved how you used the term cultural ancestors. Mm -hmm. I felt like this was as much my story as it was Ruth Middleton's and Dorothy's. Um, and I was heartbroken to find that Dorothy was the last descendant that you had mm -hmm. discovered. Um, but because I'm a critical reader, I know that Rosa, Rosa Jones had two other children. And so I'm hopeful mm -hmm. um, that someone from that family uh, has been able to at least recover this story as their own. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I am just so grateful to to be able to tell this story to other people. And I have been telling it like everybody. I'm like, my mama, my cousin, <laughs> everybody. I'm like, listen, you need, just read the book, listen to it. Like it just gave me such a sense of pride mm -hmm. to know that these black women, um, as you say, were love's practitioners. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't even get to talk about that. Cause, mm -hmm. you know, talk about a gut punch moment. That chapter, mm -hmm. that introduction, this idea of black women being love's practitioners. Uh, mm -hmm. It just it just it sat with me. So I just want to thank you for allowing the world to have more insight into these women, into this artifact. I think this is a treasure not just to the academy, but to the world. Um, and I will hush and allow our, our distinguished guest to, to end with any words that you would like to share with our audience. Oh, Camila, thank you. This is such a rich conversation. I mean, you brought things out that um, I don't know that I would have said out loud, but I'm glad <laughs> we have some of these serious and, and deep issues. And it's been just such a joy to be here with you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Charles Literary Festival for having us at the closing event. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you. So that concludes our conversation, unfortunately. Um, and I tried not to give any spoilers. So if you have not completed the book, please go out and get it. This is a phenomenal story, particularly for those of us who are living in the city of Charleston. And there are landmarks. I'm going to see the house on Charlotte Street. Mm -hmm. I've made it my business. I need to go see mm -hmm. this place. Mm -hmm. um, and just sit there and be among the spirit of, of Rose and where she may have had her final time with her daughter, Ashley. Yes. Um, so thank you for everyone for tuning in. I hope the festival was enjoyable and I hope that this uh, event in particular sits with you and carries you into um, another space, a very warm space. Um, so thank you so much. Have a good evening. Goodbye everyone.